Dirty Moderates, uh, on the program today, I would argue is certainly one of, if not the preeminent voice, warning of the dangers of Trumpism. Um, he's the longtime political operative. He needs no introduction, but in case you have been abducted, you have been abducted by aliens. <laughs> Steve Schmidt is the founder, author, and host of The Warning, which is a digital media company, a newsletter, um, a podcast, uh, a YouTube channel. But of course, uh, Steve is is long known for his work in politics. John McCain's 2008 campaign manager. Uh, he successfully led Arnold Schwarzenegger to the uh, governorship in California. Um, he worked for uh, the George W. Bush reelect in 2004 and spent 10 years as an analyst with MSNBC. He was also a co-founder of the Lincoln Project, which he left in 2021. But it is with great pleasure I welcome Steve Schmidt to the program. Thank you, Adam. Such a nice uh, intro. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to start with something before we get into um, what you uh, posted today and everything else. One of the things that I think you highlight very well is the deep well of mistrust that, that this country has in its institutions. It's been a heartbreaker for me at my tender age of 49 to grow up believing in America and its institutions and seeing them under such assault on a regular basis um, from Trumpism, but from illiberalism in general. And yesterday, CBS News posted um, Walter Cronkite's final broadcast from March 6th of 1981. And I watched it and I started to cry. And I said, you know, why am I getting misty eyed? And I said, oh, this will be a great thing to bring up to Steve because as he's signing off, he said, look, basically I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the clip, but basically he says, Doug Edwards was my predecessor. He was an honorable guy doing honorable work. I will be succeeded by Dan Rather in this chair. This is a time of transition, but no matter whoever sits in this chair, I'm surrounded by superb journalism and 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 the ability to tell American tell the American people what they need to know, et cetera, et cetera. And none of that will change, he says. And he signs off with his trademark. That's the way it is, you know. And I watched this and cried because that just isn't the case anymore. And of course, we don't have three networks anymore, and those days are long gone. But he was he embodied such a sense of trust and respect and admiration. I wanted to start with that because I know that you speak to this very eloquently and um, it was, it was a salient, painful thing for me to watch. Well, Walter Cronkite was of a generation like Eric Severide, one of Edward R. Morrow's boys, as they were called. And they were all together in London during the blitz, during the, height of the Second World War, where they saw manifested before most American eyes the danger and the, and the evil of fascism. And so you had this great drama that played out over the 1930s. We look at this moment in time and we say, well, has anything like this ever happened before? And the truth of the matter is, in 1940, really the dominant political opponent to FDR in the country was the anti-Semite Charles Lindbergh, who had been decorated by the German government, uh, who was an apostle of nationalism, isolationism, fascism, um, who, hit, uh, who Roosevelt believed was a, you know, who Roosevelt believed was a, uh, was a, was a Nazi. Uh, all of this moment, right, in, in time has, has played out uh, before. You, you understand what it is. You, you see what's coming down the pike. And I think it's important to be able to articulate it, you know, within a frame. And so those journalists who stood on that rooftop in London, and told the American people the story, the aggressiveness of the war that was coming, that people with good sense understood that what was at hand was something in the end was not escapable from. Mm -hmm. And so there was tremendous trust 
there was a bond that existed in that era between government and journalism. And a lot of that is shattered Mm. in 1965 when under false pretenses, America's poor white plus blacks plus brown or disproportionately send to fight and die in a war that the leadership of the country knew from day one could never be won. And that that breaks something decisively uh, in the American culture, in the social compact. And you're dealing with that literally 55 years later because the generation that was chiefly affected by it is still in power. Right. So, you know, it's interesting when you think of the, the um, let's call it the arc of American history. You know, one of the things that is true is that the country's polarized. One of the things that's also true if in students of history, of which you're chief among them know is the country has always been somewhat polarized. I mean, we did have a civil war in this country where 700,000 plus um, American boys were murdered. Okay, excuse me. And we have had um, divisions that are as old as the Republic's founding. You know, I mean, even though they kind of mended fences at the end, the letters between Adams and Jefferson are vicious and vituperative. And you see that, you know, it's newspapers, by the way, we're always partisan for those that don't know. It's, you know, uh, when people think of you know, the dangers and the menace of Fox News. Of course, the reach, I guess, is arguably different, but there was always like for essentially a Republican or a Democrat or a Federalist or Anti-Federalist paper kind of warring at each other for the war of American ideas. But there is no mistaking the fact that despite the guardrails have been put in place, we haven't experienced anything quite like Donald Trump, or at least we don't think so. And we weren't alive then. We don't know. Um, we only know history, but we haven't been able to um, experience in either of our lifetimes, and we're roughly contemporary, Steve, the, the, the deep level of malice that has come from this iteration of the Republican Party. And I wanted to uh, touch on that as I read uh, your um, reproducing of your tweets from 2018, if I could. Um, this is what you tweeted on June 20th, 2018. It's in your, it's in Steve's uh, newsletter, The Warning. You should all be subscribed to this if you're not. Steve writes, this summer will mark six years since I left the Republican Party, of which I had been a member for 29 years. What I saw and felt then has been proven out by events, facts, and the endurance of Donald Trump. Here is what I said on June 18th, 2018. And this is why I want to focus on this. 29 years and nine months ago, you wrote, I registered to vote and became a member of the Republican Party. For those listening, this is key, which was founded in 1854 to oppose slavery and to stand for the dignity of human life. Today, I renounce my membership in the Republican Party. It is fully the party of Trump. I wanted to dive into that with you. I don't think people understand that what what events led up to the creation of the Republican Party and what it really represented. You know, they sort of think of hallowed images of Lincoln, which are you know justified, but it's a lot more to it. And there's a reason you joined it and there's a reason you worked for it. And there's a reason you believed in it as I am someone with a hybrid of political views, but holds a lot of deeply conservative small C principles that are that have been abandoned and trashed in the name of a total piece of shit con man. Um, I know there's a lot in there, sure, but let's unpack sure. it. Look, I, yeah. I think like as a, as a matter of history, yeah. Um, in 1854, uh, the political parties such as they were fell apart right. because you had a issue that was a moral issue and there was no longer a compromise on it. The compromise is what had broken apart and the issue that had broken it was slavery. So in 1854, the Nebraska Act is passed, and what it allows for is the spread of slavery westward. And this is this is not acceptable as, at any level as a proposition uh, to Northern Whigs. And these Northern Whigs become the foundation of the Republican Party. The editor of the New York Tribune is a man named Horace Greeley. And Horace Greeley proclaims, he says, that what the Republican Party will be 
is the greatest party for freedom the world has ever known. And so when you look at what this party was, what it stood for, at its core was the preservation of the union, which over time, and Frederick Douglass hits this very cleanly because he doesn't give Abraham Lincoln uh, hagiography in his right. eulogy. Uh, that the moral proposition uh, for the abolitionist cause uh, becomes necessitous uh, as a core uh, to justify the immense loss of life mm -hmm. in the Civil War. And it ultimately includes the service of a million blacks who fight uh, and die for their emancipation and freedom under the U.S. flag in the in the Union Army, and and so this party um, produces Lincoln, and it produces his heirs, and his heirs are Grant, and his heirs are Garfield, um, and these heirs are steeped in a virtue, and that virtue is a commitment to civil rights, a commitment to reconciliation, a commitment to justice. And what happens? They are assassinated, right? Two of them. And Grant's reputation is smeared. And this is so important to understand. When you look at the events of January 6th and the mythology and you say, well, wow, I watched that. How can it be? How can it be that national political leaders will look at a TV camera and talk about those criminals as patriots and so on and so forth and the mythologizing of this? When Grant dies in 1885, it's the most famous American in the world. Next to Lincoln, this is the most important person who saves the country. His life is one of struggle, of fortitude. Every quality which you would admire about a human being, you can find in Grant's story. Yet by 1920, the savior of the Union is remembered as what? A drunk, a butcher, butcher. Yeah. and a corrupt president. And the real virtue was found in what? The lost cause, Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. The virtue winds up in this association with the loser, deeply attached to this idea, melded into the American mythology of the status of the underdog, the chance that anybody can make it. And so this mythology right, has always stewed, has always percolated, and it manifested itself. It manifested itself in the 1920s with the revanchist KKK, manifested itself in opposition to expansion of civil liberties and civil justice in the 1950s and the 1960s, and it's manifesting it today as part of an enormous backlash to the first black presidency, Mm -hmm. into a tremendous amount of social justice progress on a lot of issues where you can say at the end that fully this idea that we're all created equally has at long last been fulfilled. That certainly as a legal matter, regardless of sexual orientation, race, creed, gender, everyone is created equal. Everyone is protected by the law until, oh, wait a second. And here we are. Yeah. And it's interesting because the lost cause happens, you know, obviously after the Civil War. Statues go up after the Civil War to sort of refurbish the image of traitors, quite frankly. And the 11 states have seceded and try to tear the Union apart. But then you get to the Woodrow Wilson's presidency and he shows birth of a nation in the White House. As he is now, he had a mixed legacy, too, and his popularity ebbed and flowed. But certainly at that was still a period of time to your point where Ulysses S. Grant was 
dismissed and not well regarded. And I will say two things. The Ron Chernow book really does a lot to resurrect him. The recent biography five, six years ago on Grant. But for those listening, you sh- everybody should read Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs. If you, They are absolutely some of the greatest literature I've ever read, let alone military memoirs. I mean, they, they, they speak a lot to your point of virtue. And these overlapping cross currents in politics, Steve, that now have manifested all the way through a segregationist Democratic Party to a to a Trumpist Republican Party are alive and well. And I, I you know, it must be said also because I don't I don't know how many people know this that you know one of the more honorable things in politics I ever saw was your and Senator John McCain's decision not to divisively play the race card against Barack Obama. And yeah. you could have, you know, I, I mean, you watch that video when he tells that woman he's not in there. I mean, today's party and even even the party maybe of five years ago, but certainly today, grace, humility, virtue doesn't matter. It's it's so. So, again, there is a leadership role that matters here, but also character does matter. You know, like Mitt Romney recently said, you know, we're not here debating tax policy anymore or you know what we should be spending on here we should be in that position but we're not we're deep deep dealing with a deeply derelict movement that really is revanchist to use your word and and in many ways has come to sort of represent the the sort of like dark ages of the united of united states history that we're living through it's not just the dark ages of American history, right? We, we're going to talk about like the dark ages for, for a second, right? Sure. In, in every spiritual tradition, yeah. in every religion all over the world, there's this concept of humanity and the human being and the innate dignity of the human body, the human soul. And so over time, because of this inalienable truth, there are expansions in the demand by human beings who organize into communities, into nations for rights. And this is a world of kings and emperors Mm. and slaves where might makes right. An era that lasts for centuries of conquering, Mm -hmm. of death, but slowly an evolution of this idea. In the accumulation of all of this wisdom, in all of these cultures meets its highest form and its highest expression in all of human history in 1776 through a declaration by a deeply imperfect human being about the rights of man that becomes the rights of women and ultimately black people and ultimately gay people. And this declaration in the middle of a great civil war, as Lincoln talks about it, is reconsecrated in the Gettysburg Address Mm -hmm. as the organizing core of American society. What what the birth of the United States unleashed was something at its the moment when the white flag went up at Yorktown, it was said that the Marquis de Lafayette, commanding general of forces, exclaims that humanity has its victory, liberty has its country. And what he believed would flow from that was justice, slowly, inexorably. He predicted that the last place really in civilized society that slavery would exist in the West was the Deep South. 
right? He saw the contradictions in the society, but he also saw the power of the idea and the ideal. And that's the American story. And what Trump stands for, right, yeah. is a revolution against what in the Revolutionary War was called the cause. Mm. The cause. Joe Ellis has a book coming out on that. Liberty. By the way. Yeah. Right. And this, it's the most noble in human history. And so is the country imperfect? Of course it is, because it is a country of the people, by the people, for the people. And we, made up of all the peoples of the world, are an imperfect people. Mm. But the idea is worth preserving. And we're in a moment of great testing because Trump's coalition is fanaticism plus indifference. Mm. And is that enough? Is that enough in a toxic age to wipe away one of the highest attainments of human civilization in an era of lawlessness and chaos and immense suffering that will follow the catastrophe that will come because at the core, what Donald Trump is promising is war. He's mm -hmm. promising war. And I think it's very important at the end of the long lifespans of the people who survived humanity's greatest conflict, its greatest crucible, that we understand very clearly the risk that a President Trump brings over the next five years. It's immense. It is. And, you know, here we are, post-Super Tuesday, ready to spend the next eight months and I do believe this to be true. Some people in the media don't like it when others like myself say it or anybody says it, but it's a rematch nobody really wanted. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that we live in this a la carte fantasy world. Like I say, you're not at the buffet where you can say, well, I'll take this and take that. No, it's Biden or bust. Biden is not by any stretch of the imagination, a strong incumbent. I'm deeply worried about his age. I think he's been an honorable, very successful president, but I uh, for the time. But he's really all that stands between us and Trump. So here we are at the precipice of this rematch. I want to get your overview of this because I do think there's gaslighting going on sometimes to the extent that people act as if you point out, let's say, Biden's frailties or age, you're somehow a traitor to democracy. No, it's because I'm so deeply worried and kept up at night by where we're at in this country that I, that I fret doesn't mean I'm not back. We're all in for Biden. There's no choice. It's America or Trump. You can't have both, right? Anybody who tells you is a matter of course, yeah. what you can say, what you can think. Yeah. And more importantly, what you can't say, particularly when it's true, right. is part of the problem we're facing in the country. Right. So, so Joe Scarborough said something. Okay. Um, and I think it was really underreported. He said, nobody okay. comes on my show ever, no Democrat, and says on camera what they say off camera. Wow. So what, what does it mean when the nation's journalists and these shows feature a conversation that's wholly inauthentic between politician and quote unquote journalist who are really part of the same shared chimera, same shared reality show where there's an insider conversation and an outsider conversation. Right. And so I just did a, I just did a podcast with Tara Palmario. I think she's a superb political reporter at Puck News. Right. Yeah. And, you know, with Tara gets that, that the overwhelming majority of political journalists don't, right, is when she goes in a Cafe Milano, right? Those are all the same people, right? Whether mm -hmm. they're wearing the MAGA hat or not, right? They're all they're all part of the right, they're all part of the same, they're all part of the same ecology. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all it's all part of the same, right? It's all part of the same thing. And so I, I think when you look at this in its 
in its totality, mm -hmm. right? In this in this moment right now. Um there's a couple of things um that are just true. It's nice to say that democracy is the preeminent issue. But it's really not. It's Joe Biden's ego. <laughs> right? right. I, I want right. Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl, not Joe Namath. Right. And I appreciate <laughs> right from a right. performance level, right? So 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 80% of the country is saying we don't want the choice. Now the right. two political parties that the country are told constantly and there is an element of gaslighting here. Never agree with each other about anything. They do agree with each other on one thing, which is this yeah. is the choice. Yep. And that's the choice. Right? And so so the choice we have um and you look at Biden's candidacy, and I think there's a lot of people that fall into this category. I am unhappy about it, okay. but I will vote for Biden. Yep. Right. I share the Mark Cuban position. He could be hooked up in a cryogenic tube. I'm voting for. Him. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. One one hundred percent. But that being said, yeah. Right. Generational change is a moral issue. Yeah. It's a moral proposition. I think the act is irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I think it's an act of ego. Mm -hmm. The result is the only Democrat who can conceivably lose to Donald Trump is going to be the nominee of the party. And because there's 244 days left, there's time to say something yeah. and let it sink in. Because I, I just want to give my trigger warning early. Right. As I as I talk about this, if Trump wins. Yep. Right. And we can stop it. But if he wins, please spare me the fucking parade and the protest and all yep. of it the next day. Right. Right. Spare me. Right. And, and just so the Biden people understand. Yep. Right. His legacy. Will be one thing. Right. He, he will be the guy like Captain Smith who plowed the Titanic in full speed into the ice fields. And it. Yeah. It'll be his legacy. And, and, and I promise you, we will then have two presidents back to back who will never have a presidential library. Right. And this country will eventually recover through this age of enormous, devastating, consequential egotism mm -hmm. by a generation that will have shattered its reputation, shattered its reputation. And the country and its politics will be forever changed because who will be the first Democrat mm -hmm. to emerge and to say, it's Kamala Harris's turn, <laughs> right? Right. It's her turn. I, I, you know something, Steve? Can I say something? Can I first to say after after he bullshit the country, right? Say no, you don't understand, right? Like Joe Biden's a cross between Einstein and Abraham Lincoln. Gavin uh, Newsom, right. right? It's his turn, right? right? Like I don't think there's an appreciation mm. for how shattering, yeah, how shattering to the Democratic Party loss will be loss will be and so and so this is a moment of very very high stakes and and everybody's position now post super tuesday it's all in it's all in yeah. right so this is the choice right we watch joe biden tonight and the idea though that for the next 244 days everybody has to be silent about the obvious that talking about what everyone can plainly see is somehow giving away the game to Trump is really one of the dumbest absurdities, right, of the age, right? It's it's preposterous. It's illogical, right? It's 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 really it's almost like a child's like, right, sensibility of the world, right? If you hear it, it becomes true. It's a, it's astonishing that adults actually adopt that position and assert it publicly in the context of the nation's politics 
in a presidential campaign. It's truly astonishing. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, because uh, you played such a big role in helping to defeat Trump last time, you've got this really odd thing in history. I, I, I've said this, I think I've said it on the show, but I don't know that never has a ticket in presidential, in my lifetime, been more right for one election season and more wrong for the other. Meaning, you know, I think Joe Biden probably was the only person four years ago who could have done what he did. Um, he was able to be Uncle Joe and pull in those, you know, purplish counties and COVID and Trump. It was obviously a confluence of horrible events. We were in a racial reckoning moment and Kamala seemed like the right person. I mean, I live in California. I, I never had anything particularly crazy. I'm not crazy about her, but I'm certainly not a hater. Um, I'm I'm gobsmacked by how politically incompetent she seems interview after interview. It's something I'm never going to understand as vice president of the United States, you know, you're going to sit with Leslie Stahl. You know, you're going to sit with Lester Holt. You know, you're going to be asked about the border and you remain incompetent and you giggle. And no, of course, racism and sexism are at work, but that doesn't let you off the hook. So there's that. Joe Biden is appreciably older. You might even say senescent, you know, in the sense that you just start to age in that way, not senile, but senescent. And, you know, you've got not only an all in mentality, You've got a tribalism, okay? And I'm with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna vote for a you know like a, a cryogenic person before Trump. But you've got a tribal mentality in the media and among the Democratic Party that says not only is Joe Biden the right guy, every single thing he's done has either been wonderful or misunderstood. The other night on election night, I was watching Jen Psaki and Rachel Maddow, and I like them both. I don't know them, but I, I certainly like them. Sneering at voter concerns about immigration. Joking about Virginia and West Virginia having a border. Why would they care about the border? You know, just sort of going into the worst kind of elite level condescension that you've seen. And I'm watching this. And boy, did I get palpitations of 2016. Because nobody likes that. And everybody knows that Trump's cruelty at the border doesn't mean that Biden's border has been successful. You know, both things can be true. And we have a terrible time in our illiberal age of reconciling competing ideas, which by many a wise man's account is the hallmark of intelligence. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you can complain about bad policies and say the guy's too old and still say you're going to vote for him, but only around certain people. I've gotten attacked many times about it. How dare I? And, you know, you know, you'd think I said that Tucker Carlson should be president, but we are in that age, Steve, you know, we're honest, honest, vigorous debate. I would even argue back to your word. Virtue is like nowhere to be found because we all live in bullshit land and we have this inability in the asymmetry of our party system. So the right, and it's in the right wing, is clearly the more dangerous threat. But that doesn't mean that the far left and certain things the Democratic Party has done aren't illiberal as well. doesn't mean they're equal, but they all feed into a, I think, a deep well of discontent, mistrust, and um, restive, a restive mood where people are ready to blow the whole damn thing up. We live in a country yeah. where 40% of people don't have $400 of cash available. Yeah. For an emergency. Right? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, so I'm going to give you like, I'm going to give three, three quick examples. There, there's a black woman uh, who was arrested in Ohio and charged charges were dropped okay. um, for desecration of a corpse after she, deposited the remnant of a miscarriage into a toilet. Now, the backstory of this is that she's 25 weeks, two, three days pregnant. She has vaginal bleeding. She goes to the emergency room. She sits there for nine hours. Does anyone see her? No one sees her. Um, they do convene a hospital ethics committee meeting to debate what to do medically because of the state's new law. So she leaves, comes back the next day, third day has the miscarriage. 
Let me ask you a question. Does she live in a democracy? She doesn't live in a democracy. No. If you're one of the tens of millions of people in the country who's unbanked. Yeah. Paycheck lending. Right. Usury yeah. rates. Right. You're an enlisted soldier living in some filthy shithole <laughs> while college kid seventy thousand eighty thousand ninety thousand dollar a year schools living in a penthouse people want to be seen they want to be heard yeah. so this issue of the border I will just say with no demagoguery, right? If you watch Fox News and yeah. I've talked to some, you know, people, let's say in their 70s and 80s who genuinely believe Portland is gone, right? Portland, Oregon is yeah. gone, right? It burned down in the Black Lives Matter riots years ago. You know, you watch Fox, like it's like Nagasaki, right? It's been gone, <laughs> it's gone for years now, right? But, but let me say, right, we, when you okay. go into Los Angeles, right? you go into San Francisco, as someone who's lived there, holy shit. I'm in L.A. now. Right? Holy shit. Yeah. Right? New York City, Denver, right? If you are sitting and laughing about the border, and I say this as someone who is always a supporter of the Grand Compromise, but let me just yeah. say this, right? That's all over. Right, because the yeah. open border policy of if three, four million people got into the country illegally, we're going to have decades of essentially closed immigration at a moment in time when we have the highest foreign born population in the history of the country. And so so there's going to be a big consequence to this. And in this issue, absolutely could elect Donald Trump. Yeah. And anybody who does not understand its potency, yep. um, who does not understand Trump's demagogic talents eight years right. in is an extremely, extremely either naive person, yeah. intentive person, or indifferent person. Because because you have to be out of touch at a pretty special level to not get the simmering anger in this country over this issue. Everywhere. Everywhere. And so this idea that this isn't potent you know people say all the time to me you know there's some line you know why doesn't someone you know in kansas or this state you know vote this way you know right. in this way because it's in their interest right and no one ever seems to kind of get the inherent condescension in the question but putting that aside yeah right, i'm like i always say to them like how many how many union plumbers do you think work at the dnc <laughs> <laughs> how many carpenters right right it's mostly right. like woke, woke like millennials with like yeah. like Harvard right. degrees. Yep. Right. Like you know. Yeah. It's not. It's a problem. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that I've encountered and I've I've taken up for. Well, I say you taken up for the the Joe Walshes and the you and all of you who have in the Never Trumper camp. You know, like myself, I used to be a Democrat, used to be a Republican. I think you're a Democrat now, though, aren't you, Steve? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm an independent. OK, you know, when liberals say to me and I grew up in a liberal environment with liberal family, and it's, this is not them, but pretty much a liberal circle. I've kind of always been the, the gadfly. And, you know, you guys, meaning us, you know, or ex-Republicans, you know, you're just you're really just still Republicans and you don't really care about the Democrats. You know, you're just out to get Trump, et cetera, et cetera. You know, to which I say, you know, it's so classic liberal Democrat philosophy, right? Liberal Democratic. I hate to say liberal Democrat. You know, we don't need you. We know better than you. Yeah, you're on the team, but get in the back of the bus. You don't know what you're doing. 
To which I would say, well, these are the same people that wipe the floor with your ass in American politics for 25 years. And num but number two, that's just the political part of it. But, but the policy part of it is we're just trying to tell you people do care about inflation who buy groceries and eggs. Maybe you don't. That doesn't mean, okay, again, here's let's win one for nuance is what we do in this program. Inflation hasn't come down, but prices haven't come down. So yes, but to go out there and extol the virtues of an economy that, as you put it, isn't working for at least 40% of the people is just stupid. And then ignoring immigration because you do live in a penthouse in D.C. or Chicago and don't care doesn't make it not so or doesn't make it not relevant. And what I grieve about is the parties used to have wings, regional wings and, and you know, liberal Republicans, conservative Democrats. And when I worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Bob Graham of Florida, he was a great example of that. A guy that could understand that when he went and talked to Bob Dole about farm policy, Bob Dole knew a fucking thing about farm policy. And other things, you know, and vice versa. You know, George McGovern and Bob Dole helped save the food stamp program in America. Dole and Moynihan did Social Security. I mean, it's it's this idea that ideas can't be put together um, because if you do so, you are that's a traitor to your cause. You're a traitor to democracy is also hurting democracy. That doesn't mean. All eyes on the prize. We got to stop Trump. But Trump has, I do think, broke what I would call the left, maybe not all the Democratic Party, so profoundly that their reaction to anything that comes out of anything it, for what's left of the right that has any sensible claim is irrational. You know, because the borders associated with him, inflation, and nobody wants to talk about these things. And an old president, you know, with a lot of, with a right track, wrong track number heading in the wrong direction does not make me sleep easy at night, despite my supporting. I tell this story. Um, <laughs> I tell this story, you know, to, you know, to different groups, but um, yeah. the uh, Canadian prime minister during the second world war, Mackenzie King used to stay in the white house. He was close to Roosevelt and he had yeah. this, awareness in the moment that FDR was a world historic figure and he took very careful notes of their conversations and FDR and he were talking about the world to come after the war late into the night and FDR is talking about collective security the United Nations the primacy of the United States is the most powerful nation the end of fascism uh, e-colonialism. And he talks about the world as a visionary, but the architect uh, of something that very close to that vision that comes, that prevails in the Cold War, mm -hmm. uh, longer twilight than he, than he thought. But FDR says to Kang, um, that it's his ambition that such a world will, will, will endure, not forever, because nothing does, uh, but for as long as everybody who is alive on the day the war is won is still alive. And so I wrote on my warning substack a week or two ago, just maybe a couple of days ago, it all runs yeah. together, yeah. a piece about coming into the world in 1970. And the big thing that has changed between today and when I was younger in my adulthood, and, and what it is, is the presence of the generation who were like 50, mm -hmm. our age, when, when we were born, a little older, yeah, um, who were around for a good part of our lives. And they would have understood what this is. It would have yeah. understood what the what the danger is, what the what the rhetoric alludes to, where it leads, right? Where mm -hmm. retribution and vengeance. They would understand when a Vladimir Putin basically says to a useful idiot that anywhere there is a Russian, 
there is Russia. That's what Putin said in an hour. The last person to deliver that message or a version of it said it like this. Wherever there is a German, there is Germany. Mm. There is the Reich. Right. And, and so no. without a context to understand what's happening this moment, you know, there's a there's a video that somebody posted this morning uh, of Richard Nixon in 1994 talking about uh, a uh, Russia that is neo imperialist. Yeah. What will happen if democracy fails that yep. I hadn't seen before? And it's shocking in that. It's so accurate yep. in this moment. We have expanding wars in Europe, uh, across the Middle East. There's hundreds of Americans who've been wounded, and it. it's not talked about on the on the national news where trivialities are are, are celebrated. Um, right. You know, when you talked about before with Cronkite, you know, the reality is is when you talk about the partisan history of newspapers and everything in this era, right? There was that brief respite. Yeah. You know, it lasted, you know, for about 50 years or so, you know, yeah. corporatized, profit driven media that's, you know, built on empires of debt um, are not sustainable business models and are not capable structurally of delivering truth um, in an unbiased fashion um, because of who they are and where the money comes from, and where the ratings come from, and how they come in the age of the algorithm. So it's a, so it's a, so it's an interesting moment in American life. No doubt. Yeah. About it. Yeah. I mean, I, I always go back to, I always, I'm sure you agree or uh, might champion it too, you know, that Tocqueville wrote the best book on America I've ever read. A Frenchman who came over to study the penal system, originally the Rhode Island penal system, and then you know took this journey with his best friend across a young America, 1835. But he noticed something that was unique, besides the fact we were the only country not founded on aristocracy or class and didn't have that feudal hangover. He saw civic associations and religious groups and localities forming community and making decisions as um a center of gravity, but also a um, uh, a point of your of point of virtue, you know, a cohesive glue, if you will. And we've lost local news, right? I am not a particularly religious person, but I was raised Jewish and I'm spiritual. But people don't go to churches, certainly in synagogue. It's down tendencies. I'm not suggesting that people need to. Certainly, civic groups of an era are on decline and there is a secular religion that in you know, a nature pours a vacuum that takes its place. And that's the algorithmic anger of Tucker Carlson told me that the subways in the, Mo in Moscow are like cathedrals. They're so beautiful. They were built by Stalin. Aren't they beautiful? And you can come out of the subway. Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, that guy said this and people feel like they're living on safe streets in a safe world. That's what he says said and says, and that's what they talk like, Krem the Kremlinologists among us. But that's your news, right? So what's your religion? Well, fuck everybody who doesn't like that. Let's be more like Russia. I mean, these, these are the kind of brain-dead deductions people arrive at from a snippet of information that they gather off their Facebook page or their conspiratorial YouTube channel, wherever they are. And that says a lot. You know? The algorithm in and of itself is kind of like a little authoritarian, isn't it? Absolutely, right? And what you're talking about, right, I get a core level is a key thing that that is central to the American character, right? And it's, right. And it's community, community. Yeah. Right? And the dissolution of community. And if you, if you were to go back over – the last, like, let's call it 40 years. You want to watch a debate or a presentation where the person lays out, this is where we are today. And if we do these things, this is what will happen. Right. And you watch it, 
decades later, and you're like, huh, that guy was right. <laughs> right? That, that person, that person, right, is Ross Perot. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. person is Ross Perot. Right. So, so putting aside all the wackiness, if you were just to go back in time, you were, you were to say from, you know, whenever in the 70s, the 60s, that all across the country, communities would be hollowed out. Right. That they would be de deconstructed. The hardware store would close. The places of gathering would close. Right. Right. You know, I'll say, you know, for example, Starbucks, right? What was Starbucks, right? Starbucks, right, in a community void, right, come to the conformity of the coffee store where you at least can gather, right? But people, the ceremonies of gathering, secular and otherwise, right? Even sports, right, where it was a low-key thing. You sat on the hillside or the bench. Now kids are touring around like they're all going to be, right, playing you know, professional baseball, right? They're all going to be draft, right? The parents are driving hundreds of miles. Everything that you're told about the mental health crisis in the country and, and the statistics evidence, a profound one. Mm -hmm. There's a link to isolation. Mm. And what Trump has created is a community of vile purpose uh, and grievance, but one that finds virtue in its togetherness. And what Trump is at his core is a philosopher of fuck youism. Yeah. And there are a lot of people in America who deserve a fuck you. A lot of them. Yeah. On Wall Street, in the news media, across all of the corridors of power, right? Where the CEO of the publicly traded companies making $98 million a year, yeah. where all of the norms have been shattered. And so, what, what Trump offers is really like a 32 ounce high sugar soda. Right. Pure crapola, but satisfying in the moment. Doesn't build anything. It'll make you soft, fat, lazy, and stupid in the end, but refreshing in the moment. Right. And so you have this great philosopher of fuck youism from Queens, New York, which which is a which is a particular culture. Oh yeah in the country, a particular place in the country that most of the country doesn't get, but that Trump is so thoroughly from, yeah. so absolutely part of, it's so fundamental to who the guy is, and so utterly part of why so much of the national medium can't understand him because they're yeah. too soft and too privileged and too highly educated have ever met anyone like him and so yeah yeah right it's this it's this it's this moment we've arrived at where first principles are at stake and right the 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 ideas and the country matter much more than these institutions of of party you know which are imperfect vessels right you know the democratic party exists now as an institution to oppose us and, and opposing it means independent of Biden have to hold the house. Yep. Have to have to get the majority back in the house. Yeah. Have to be able to control the federal budget. Have to be able to control the nominations process in the Senate. And hopefully to be able to control the executive branch before it's it is um its powers are truly tested in an extraordinary declaration of intent that Trump's already been made, that I am not restrained in any way, shape, or form. I'm a king. I can do whatever I want. What do you think, Steve, happens to the Republican Party going forward? And I don't ask that, you know, to like pull out a 
you know, a magic eight ball or a fortune cookie. I don't mean it like that. I mean, historically, right. We have seen, we had the Republicans grow out of the ashes of the Whigs, and, you know, parties have changed. We haven't had in a long time in this country, but I mean, he goes away at some point. Is Trump ism still a, a, a virulent disease or can nobody carry the mantle? Cause Ron DeSantis tried and he's just a bogus tribute band. And I, and, and a lot of time, like I think of 2022 when all the lunatics who ran the majority of whom lost, I think almost everybody who were, who ran this kind of election deniers, they conceded and they were gone, which I thought was encouraging. So in this void, right in this, in this hollowed out cult of personality, masquerading as a political party what do you think happens i i think that so the the defining event yeah in the country's history that it's impossible to understand america without understanding is the civil war right, right? it's the sectional war and so and i don't want to indict the south and and one of the things that most people don't understand about the Civil War is that there's no hill county, no hill country, right, that didn't remain loyal to the Union, right? So West Virginia remained loyal. Yeah. Uh, the hill country of Tennessee, General Sherman's personal guard were the first Alabama, right? The planter class of the South, the Southern aristocracy, mm -hmm. the places from the core where Jim Crow was imposed, hmm. the constitution of the Confederacy as hmm. manifested in the cornerstone speech by Alexander Stevens, hmm. when he talks about the deficiencies of the U S constitution and the glories of the constitution of the Confederacy which cement the racial superiority of the white man, okay? This, this strain, right, has been fundamental, right? It is the darkness that competes against the light in American life, right? It's a heart, it's a darkness, right, of the, of the human soul, mm. right? But this, this, is, this has always been an element of America's life. When, when the Washington Monument was being built, construction was stopped for a quarter of a century because the Pope made a donation of marble and the Catholic marble was thrown in the Potomac River by the know-nothings. Right. right? So, so the Southern Party has always been such as it has been a virulence in American culture, in mm -hmm. life. And you get to say it's been a virulence because in the end, we have a Lincoln Memorial, not a Jefferson Davis Memorial. Right. We have a Washington Monument, not a Robert E. Lee Monument. Right. right. And so... And so because of this, right, the Republican Party, right, has manifested itself now as the vessel for a disease that has been a constant. It has risen, it's subdued, it's become embers, but it's never stopped burning. Mm -hmm. It was the revanchist Ku Klux Klan in the 20s after it was annihilated by Grant in the 1880s. It always comes back. Yep. The great, the great kind of tribute that was given to William F. Buckley was he kicked all the kooks out of the Republican Party, the John Birchers, yeah. the anti-Semites. Yep. But that was an illusion. They've yeah. always been there. And and what Trump did, like pulling a band-aid off, right, is rip off so 40 years of, of accumulating social mores. No, you can say this, you can do this, right? Mm. That there is no boundaries. And what you get from that culture are Lauren Boebert's and Marjorie Taylor Greens 
and you get a Congress that looks like the bar scene from Star Wars. <laughs> right. And so, and so I was I was with a friend in I was with a friend in LA, right? We were we were in this restaurant. He's a he's a director in in Hollywood and we're kind of lamenting this stuff. And I I said, listen, I go, it's a, it's a fucking nice day here, right? And he's like, yeah. And I go, peaceful. Right? We're having a glass of wine on the on the on the patio. And he's like, absolutely. I'm like, if 35 assholes showed up here on the patio, what would we do? Would we stay and fight them? Or would we fucking leave? And, mm. and the answer is you leave. Mm. Right? Like people are busy. They have a lot going on. So like no one like kind of looks forward to Tuesday night to go down to the Republican club and fight insane people for three hours of resolutions and denunciations. But, but there's no out for the practice of politics in a free society, right? So you have to look at the rules of the parties, right? The stranglehold on the process in the system. And I do think, right. You know, I'm sympathetic to the spoiler message. Oh yeah. Right. But, if this is the choice, I'm not particularly sympathetic to that message four years from now. And I, and I think another thing is is this, is that mm. we treat our national politics like it's a Harvard admission. Yeah. Right? You got to go to the right school. You got to go to the right place. We have 330 million people in the country. And seriously, if the only people that we consider are members of the U.S. Senate and governors – and the occasional straight billionaire who manages to find their way to the debate stage and says crazy stuff, like yeah. Vivek Ramaswamy, who has a burst, right? We're we're in big trouble. Yeah, we're in big trouble, right? There's a there's a lot of people capable of national leadership who know a lot about a lot of things. Yeah, right. And and so we 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 gotta we gotta think about that in the in the future as we move past this age. But we will get past it. Yeah, there are 94,000, I think this is right, elected bodies of something in America. Right. This is this is the most complex society in human history. Times 100,000 to the exponent of 10. Yep. It's unkillable at some level because every one of those 94,000 municipalities or whatever that has an elected leader has at least two lawyers that work for them. Yep. And four years goes quick. It does. It does. And and I I I think to conclude, and I know you share the sentiment, there is so much facile kind of empty rhetoric about loving America, putting America first, wanting America to be better, et cetera, et cetera. But if uh, the true act of loving America, right, is opposing the greatest threat America has ever had in our lifetime. And that's Trump. Despite a lot of, a lot of hesitations, uh, reservations, uh, misgivings, you pick your word. There is something to that because if we, the people means anything more than the parchment, you know, it means that to remain the most successful self-governing experiment that we've ever had it's up to us, not the media, not the news, not the chattering class. Like you say, you know, not the, the, the millennials at the DNC. It's really up to people to, to make that, to make the decision of what direction they want to go. And that's that we don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but, but the, it really is. It sounds trite, but it isn't. It's, it's a, we, the people scenario are, Two th or excuse me, are one third of registered voters still not going to vote, even though 2020 had a massive turnout? Are those people still going to stay home and fuck off stoned and watching reality TV while we burn? I don't know. Are they here? Are they, you know, when they look at the numbers, I don't know. In an election this close, I don't know if those votes are Trump voters or, you know, the, the unvoted. W hello? You know, your house is on fire. So what's your final word? I just, as you're talking, it made me think about the performative patriotism of the NFL. Okay. 
fighter jets flying over the stadium, the giant hundred yard flag being waved by uniform military, jingoistic chants of USA, USA, USA. Um, and not a lot of thought right. um, about what it means to be an American. Mm. Um, and I think Colin Kaepernick gave people an opportunity in that venue to think about what it means to be an American <laughs> and, and, and no one acquitted themselves particularly well, mm -hmm. particularly not the NFL, no, not the brand sponsors, not the teams. And, and here's the deal. I don't like the act of kneeling for the national anthem. Mm -hmm. It offends me personally. Mm -hmm. But protest in a free society and dissent is meant to provoke. And meant to offend sometimes to get people to think. But a good American understands something that freedom is not defined by your sensibilities, freedom is not bound by what you think is right or wrong. What freedom means in a country is that even the most sacred symbol can be desecrated through a word, mm. through a deed, mm. without recrimination, imprisonment, death at the hands of a leader or a state because the human being has some inalienable rights to speech, to a freedom of conscience, mm. to a freedom of speech. And so I spent my whole career advising political candidates corporate leaders, CEOs about yeah. what to say in certain situations. And you're like, don't answer a hypothetical question. But there are some hypothetical questions we should consider, right? Mm. Which is, if you could put your opponent against the wall and shoot them, would you? Would you lock them up? Would you torture them until they support you? Would you harm their family? Mm destroy your life. And, and what I would say is, if you look at Hunter Biden, and you look at this moment, you look at the viciousness and you look at the cruelty, at one person who's in recovery in a country of millions of people who are in recovery, mm. in a moment of national crisis where we got to figure out how to get many millions of people more into recovery, Right. What does the political opposition want? They want him to use again, to kill himself. And the reason I ask is because the man who's the most venerated person in the history of the country, one of the most venerated in world history, and certainly the most venerated Republican in history, has a giant monument to him that's built because his life in the end was about reconciliation mm. with malice towards none, with charity for all, as bind up the wounds of the nation. And this was after a war that may have killed as many as 850,000 people. Mm. So how is it that a person has arisen in a time of relative peace and prosperity against all the tumult, all the previous decades, all the challenges that have been met and overcome, how can it be 
that someone like Trump has arisen mm. and there is an absence of a morally clear voice that can easily dispense with the offensiveness, the malignancy, the core of his message. And the answer to that speaks to the great deficiency in the institutions of our political parties, which are stacked with careerists, which are stacked with cynics, and are stacked with people who don't understand that Trump means what he's saying. Mm -hmm. It's not performative. And it should be taken seriously. And I urge everyone who's listening to us to get involved, do something, donate, make phone calls, knock on doors, go to a state, do something to be involved in your community. Because when you're not, something else will fill that space, will fill that gap. And what's filling it in American life, something very dark. Yeah, indeed. Well, I'm going to put it less eloquently than Steve. Can everybody wake the fuck up? <laughs> I mean, just wake the fuck up. Anyway, Steve, this has been my great, great pleasure. Uh, I uh, have long spiritually considered you a friend of the show, and you are now one. So please come back and see us. We'll be doing a lot of these um, through the election year. Don't leave. I'll see you on the other side. But folks, to Steve's point, get involved. Register to vote. Again, wake the fuck up. Uh, and also, of course, on a sweeter note, uh, in the meantime, stay dirty, moderate, and stay safe.